going to, uh, I'm really glad you guys are uh, here to, Paul and I have been working on this for quite some time with an international group, and you'll see a video from that, but the basic idea behind it is, um, you know, a lot of times we find ourselves in groups, in academic departments, or, you know, wherever we happen to move to, and, and we don't deliberately create or design these groups. You know, most people want to be in groups that are mutually supportive, kind, helpful, but we never do anything deliberately to make that happen. So this initiative is a, is a way of trying to make pro-social groups happen, to design them ahead of time. And I think with the Institute, we're so new and we don't have a lot of baggage like they have at other universities and stuff, we can kind of potentially do some of this. Cool. So the genesis of why we're having this talk right now is really came out of Lazar's uh, presentation a few weeks back and we were talking about anti or anti-social behaviour and afterwards in the discussion we started talking about pro-sociality um, and uh, it, yeah we just as Joseph's mentioned we thought it might be a great opportunity to give you a sense of uh, what we're doing and also see if there's opportunities for collaboration. So a couple of aims, first of all the aim of pro-social um, Think about how we're defining the word pro-social, it gets used in lots of different ways, but basically all we mean is cooperation, we mean helping behaviours, um, helping others, other individuals or groups of individuals, that's how we're defining it. So we're not talking about altruistic motivation, for example, we're talking about a set of behaviours here. Um, and our aim in this session is really just to give you enough of a feel for pro-social to decide if you want to learn some more and if you want to maybe include it in some research projects that you're doing uh, and talk more to us. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is a very short video intro, because we've got this rather sexy looking video that's only seven minutes long that probably speaks more quickly than I can. Uh, and then I'll just give you a little bit of a, uh, I just want to elaborate on that video just a bit with just a tiny bit of background and then Joseph and I are going to lead two experiential exercises so it's a little bit different to your average brown bag, you're going to get, get your hands dirty in this one and then if we've got time that'll probably be about the hour and then hopefully people will be able to stay for a bit of a discussion after that. All right. Humans are an intensely social species. We like being with each other and doing things in groups. Almost everything we do, we do in groups. In modern life, that might be business groups, there's government groups, there's voluntary associations, there's our network of friends, there's our families. And in all of these cases, we have to coordinate our behaviors and work together. And this is one thing that we do extremely well as a species. Nevertheless, there's a great deal of variation in the way groups work. Some groups mesh wonderfully, working together toward a common goal with spectacular success. Other groups aren't quite so effective. Spread out. Wouldn't it be great if we had a way, a set of methods for causing any group to function better? David Sloan Wilson is working to create just such a set of methods. Aspect. I think there might emerge to be a, a pretty big difference between a group with a history, basically, as opposed to a group that's starting fresh. Wilson is an expert on the evolutionary forces that cause groups of any species to function well or poorly. As president of the Evolution Institute, a think tank that formulates public policy from an evolutionary perspective, he's working with colleagues to create pro-social a unique framework for improving the performance of groups. Fundamentally, evolution is about change. So if we want positive change, we need to become, as I often say, wise managers of evolutionary processes. Pro-social represents a fusion of scientific disciplines from a unified theoretical perspective. It relies centrally upon the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who studied the qualities that enabled certain groups to function effectively. She studied a particular kind of group, groups attempting to manage their common pool of resources. She studied a problem known as the tragedy of the commons. Imagine a pasture owned in common by a group of farmers. Each individual farmer's short-term interest is maximized by grazing as many cattle as possible. But if everyone followed this logic, the pasture would soon be depleted, hurting the long-term interests of the group. Thus, the tragedy. 
But Ostrom studied groups from all over the world who avoided this tragedy by managing their common pool resources sustainably with fairly distributed benefits and costs. They're able to do so, sometimes for centuries, but only when certain conditions are met, only when they possess certain design features. Ostrom identified eight design principles shared by such groups, and in 2009 was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Prior to her death in 2012, Wilson worked with Ostrom and her colleagues to generalize these design principles. What we did together was to show that the design principles follow from evolutionary theory. The evolutionary dynamics of cooperation in all species and our particular history as a highly cooperative species. And second, that they apply for that reason to a much broader array of groups. Pro-social is also based on the most recent scientifically validated therapeutic techniques, including behavioral, cognitive, and mindfulness-based therapies. These methods have been applied mostly to improve the performance of individuals, but they are just as useful for groups. And we have an outstanding list of partners that are at the very top of the field in terms of therapeutic methods that are working with us on this. Among them is Stephen C. Hayes, a noted clinical psychologist and mindfulness-based therapist. The uh, task is they have to, through qualitative and quantitative means, assess the degree to which that group adheres to the design principles now. ProSocial will provide a way for groups of all kinds to improve their performance on the eight design principles. In simplified form, they are strong group identity and understanding of purpose, fair distribution of costs and benefits, fair and inclusive decision-making, monitoring agreed-upon behaviors, graduated sanctions for misbehaviors, fast and fair conflict resolution, authority to self-govern, and appropriate relations with other groups. ProSocial is currently being piloted with a variety of groups, including churches, businesses, neighborhoods, and schools. Our biggest success story to date is a program for at-risk high school students called the Regents Academy in my hometown of Binghamton, New York, in which we took a very tough situation, students that are almost certain to drop out, we created a school within a school for these students and we applied these design principles and in the first year we caused these students to do as well as the average high school student in the school system. So let's think about what we need to know if we are going to look at how population changes over time. What are some things we need to know to figure that out? It's proof that these methods can work and if they can work for schools we think they can also work for neighborhoods, for businesses, for just about any group. During the pro-social planning session, psychologist Kevin Polk tested the mindfulness-based protocol with teachers from the Regents Academy. You can behave and say things in ways that help people move over here to the toward side. Right. This graphical method helps establish the first design principle, strong group identity and understanding of purpose in a single session. If fear shows up inside of you, what's your first urge? Run. 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 We can go a long way towards causing a group to examine its goals and its structure, and we can repeat the process so that the group can continuously assess itself and adapt to its environment. ProSocial will include an internet platform that any group can join. There will be a worldwide network of trainers that can be engaged as the group level equivalent of an individual therapist. So what would that be? What's the, what's the feeling? Competition. Competition. Thank you. Competition. It will provide a way for groups to communicate directly with each other. And it will provide a scientific database to inform ongoing study that improves the performance of groups. The market for pro-social is huge and its prospects for improving human welfare are enormous. So, wow. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> it's impressive, isn't it? I, I, it always bugs me, though, that last line, having just been speaking about pro-sociality, and it says, the market for pro-social is huge. <laughs> we can make tons of money. <laughs> seems, seems like a bit, of a bit of a reversal of what we were talking about.
And you could just download that from YouTube? Yeah, actually Vimeo. Uh, if, you, if you Google Vimeo Pro Social, V-I-M-E-O. Well, we have the, it's on the web page, isn't it? Yeah, uh, probably. There's a Pro Social, we, yeah. Yeah, okay, I don't know where the web page is up to at the moment, because Joseph and I and the group have been very much involved in developing it as an online platform. Originally it was going to be facilitated like what we're going to do today, but we're sort of moving a lot of our energy into having it as an online platform that any group can use. The pilot, which will start in the next couple of months, is probably, you know, we're, we're aiming to have 100 organisations involved, so we're trying to make, David Sloan Wilson certainly has very big visions for what this could be. Look, um, I wanted to just pick up on a couple of, uh, go into a little more depth on the idea of multi-level selection, which is one of the theoretical bases for what we're doing. You could probably use self-determination theory just as easily, or you could use uh, uh, th theories of social psychology, but certainly David Sloan Wilson's coming from the point of view of a thing called multi-level selection. And I just wanted to briefly explain that because I think it's a really interesting idea, very contentious, um, but really worthwhile. So this was a, a quote, quite a long quote, from an article uh, by Eleanor Ostrom, uh, which caught my eye from 2000, and it's in an economics journal. The predictions of cooperative game theory are roughly supported only when participants in a laboratory experiment do not know the reputation of the others involved in a common pool resource dilemma and cannot communicate with them. On the other hand, when subjects communicate face to face, they frequently agree on joint strategies and keep to their agreements, substantially increasing their net returns. And I'll cut to the end. Um, more cooperation occurs when than predicted. Cheap talk increases cooperation and subjects invest in sanctioning free riders. So uh, that's basically why she won the Nobel Prize was because she was essentially saying that people can cooperate as long as they can talk to one another, uh, which I found really, it just really struck me to read this quote as a kind of you know, claim that was debatable uh, in, in an economics journal. But um, I think it says something about the human condition and where we've got to that that, that claim is um, seen as being contentious. So following um, Eleanor Ostrom's work was all about uh, people managing common pool resources. David Sloan Wilson's contribution was to broaden that and say that evolutionary theory would predict that these principles should apply for any group that has to cooperate, um, in, in, uh, even in other species, for example. The essence of multi-level selection um, the essence of the multi-level selection argument is that adaptations can occur because of selection occurring both at the individual level and also at the group level. And basically what it's trying to explain is why we should ever evolve altruistic or cooperative tendencies because individual level adaptations are locally advantageous like sharper teeth, maybe more aggression to be able to get what we want individually. But at the collective level, um, uh, they uh, social adaptations such as altruism and cooperation can be locally disadvantageous. And I was trying to think of an example of this last night and I was, um, thought of 9-11. 2,297, I know we started a bit late, but 2,297 people died in 9-11. Of that, 18.5%, nearly 20% were voluntarily died, <laughs> like they were volunteer firefighters, 414 police officers, you know, so we've got a pretty good track record in terms of 20% volunteering to sacrifice their lives for the sake of others. So why should social adaptations ever be selected then if they're locally disadvantageous? And this is the multi-level selection argument. Because for the good of the group, um, traits are advantageous at a larger scale under certain conditions. Not all conditions and never completely. Groups whose members behave for the good of the group survive and reproduce better than groups whose members are self-serving. E.O. Wilson put it this way, that selfishness beats altruism within groups. Altruistic groups beat selfish groups. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah? And that's the theory of multi-level selection. It's highly contentious, mainly because of this phrase here. Um, Pinker and, um, what's his, the, the memes guy, Dawkins. Dawkins. Um, you know, they've, they've said groups don't reproduce, uh, that they don't uh, behave in the same, they don't, they don't randomly uh, there isn't random uh, variation and so forth. So there's a lot of debate about that, but we probably don't need to go into that. I've got a really nice little example that I think is kind of um, appropriate. So uh, this was some st st uh, study done in the agricultural sector, and it's about chickens in cages, all right? Imagine you've got nine hens per cage, and you're selecting 
these chickens for whether or not they get to reproduce. And you're selecting on one of two criteria. Either you're selecting the very best individual egg layers, what Steve Hayes calls the badass chickens, right? These guys are, are the ones that are the most productive individually. Or you're selecting by cages, the cages that work most, most effectively together. Okay, that makes sense? And then you're going out six generations. Who's producing the most eggs? And before you answer, I'm, obviously I'm leading in a particular direction here, but bear in mind, in the first condition, we're choosing the best genetically adapted chickens that have the best chicken bits, whatever you need, to make eggs, you know, that they're basically genetically, these are the ones that are producing the most eggs. Or maybe think these are the ones that are producing the most scientific papers, for example, if you want an analogy. Anyway, um, so then they go out six generations. Who's producing more eggs? What do you reckon? Hey. Yeah. So this is what happens to the badass chickens. Basically, after six generations, they're all killing each other, right? They're all henpecking each other. There's only three surviving. As a group, they're incredibly unproductive, whereas the ones that are um, uh, all working together are, in fact, um, getting on very well, or relatively well, and producing the most eggs. So in, um, there are some factors How that... How long is a generation for a chicken? I have no idea. <laughs> Do you have any idea? <laughs> I mean, I they well, die, that's the generation. Yeah, one, whatever, however long a chicken lives between reproduction. I mean, there's, there's a lot of parallels in sport, aren't there? In, in sports, I thought, I mean, well, I think there's parallels everywhere. We're constantly cho choosing the best individuals and ignoring... You can make two arguments here, and I won't go into detail. You can either um, make an argument for multi-level selection, or you can just say we should be selecting for cooperative ability in individuals, Well, you should but be we selecting don't do at that. the group level, so the big pressure come from above us to select individuals yeah. and pit them against each other so we all have the highest RCI. Yeah. Is this, the argument here is to suggest that the, the best groups that form together. That's right. Space is a selection. And that's the group level bit, right? You've got a group that's already functioning well together. So some people, some are productive, some are not so productive, but they work well together. And so there's a selection pressure for them to reproduce. Um, there are a variety of sort of forces that impact upon whether um, altruism or, for the want of a better term, selfishness or individualism can predominate. One is and you can do all sorts of modelling with this, which David Sloan Wilson does and others do. Uh, one is the distribution of altruistic and selfish individuals within and between groups. And you can imagine how this works in its most extreme form. If you've got all groups with exactly the same proportion of altruists and individualists, then there's no group level selection pressure. There's only individual level selection. So individualism will win. By contrast, if you've got groups where everybody's an altruist and other groups where everybody's an individualist, then all of the selection pressure is at the group level. And so altruism will tend to win. Another force is the cost of cooperation. We can have some conditions like Wikipedia where uh, cooperation is minimally expensive relative to the benefits you get. And you can have other situations like where you're fighting a common foe where the, the benefits far outweigh the costs. And so that can change the balance of altruism and individualism. And finally, we can intentionally shift the balance um, by providing social rewards and sanctions for cooperation and, and sanctions against individualism, respectively. Uh, you can even shift the balance by what we focus upon. I think if the media is continually portraying the sort of Bunnings version of the world that we're supposed to be all protecting our own home and backyard, then uh, you know, that's what we end up doing. Now, I think there's a little bit of this going on between that and the eight principles. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop in a sec. Uh, so I think you should be a little more explicit here in step two. Between the evolutionary theory and the actual principles that we're now going to talk about, and, and um, actually Joseph's going to lead you through another exercise first, but we'll come back to these later. Um, there's a bit of backfilling. Like, it seems to me that Ostrom discovered these principles from doing a study of groups that work. So it's a sort of positive psych approach, if you like. Um, and what we're trying, what David Sloan Wilson's trying to do is say, yeah, but evolutionary theory can explain those principles. And like a lot of evolutionary arguments, you can sort of say there's a bit, it's a bit post hoc. But I think you could buy this model even just using, you know, self-determination theory or social psych or anything like that. 